everybody to music licensing for film and television and various other platforms. Today's program is being offered for one CLE skills credit. To get the credit, you will need the code word that I will provide during the program. To receive credit, you will need to email your affidavit and evaluation to Lisa Ravage at L. R-I-V-A at albanylaw.edu. For our students who could not make it today, we will be recording this program and we will reserve 10 minutes at the end of the program for any questions that you may have. Feel free to use the chat to put your questions in there. I will monitor that and make sure that our guest, Elise, can answer the questions. Finally, this program is part of our Women's Leadership Initiative 2022 Summer Series. And I'd like to thank our Albany Law School alumna, Elise Wolf Treader, for contributing her time and her talent to supporting the Women's Leadership Initiative at Albany Law School. A little bit about Elise before we get started. Elise Wolf Treader is a uh, a 1985 graduate of Albany Law School. She's a sole practitioner with over 20 years of music clearance and licensing experience. She graduated from University of Vermont in 1982 with double majors in history and English, and as I mentioned, from Albany Law School in 1985. Elise initially practiced as a litigator in New York City she gained her music licensing experience as a senior associate for an established Manhattan-based music entertainment practice, whose major client was Sony ATV Music Publishing, now Sony Music Publishing. Elise was responsible for drafting and tracking the large volume of music licenses with which the firm was retained to manage on behalf of the licensor. Elise was then hired as an independent contractor for a busy production studio to draft and review music licenses, mostly as a licensee, on many films and a number of TV productions. She reviewed composer agreements and learned about post-production in the world of film and television. This segued into more jobs, and as an independent contractor, now Elise works on behalf of a variety of large and small production companies. The productions on which she has cleared and or drafted music licenses include Tiger King, The Lost Daughter, Bombshell, Promising Young Woman, Severance, Life and Beth, as well as a podcast serial for the X Ambassadors, virtual galas for the Breast Cancer Research Foundation, and a driving tour app. Elise was admitted in New York State in the Southern District of New York and the Eastern District of New York in 1986. And you can look up more of Elise's music licensing credits on IMDb. Elise, thank you so much for being here and I will let you take it away. Okay, thank you, Mary. Hello, as Mary so ably introduced me, my name is Elise and I thank you for attending this presentation on music licensing for film and television. I'm honored to have been asked to speak on connection with the Women's Leadership Initiative. I appreciate everyone's interest, and I'd like to take a moment to dedicate this talk in memory of my father, whose birthday was today. He was a lawyer, judge, and assemblyman from Plattsburgh, New York, and my inspiration to become a lawyer. Entertainment law sounds exciting, but perhaps after listening to this lecture, you may change your mind. <laughs> Most people want to know how to become an entertainment lawyer. My path was mostly lucky, having friends in the business. The next part was up to me, being open to learning new skills and developing amicable business relationships. <clears throat> Mary has uh, covered a lot of my initial introduction in terms of how I came to be from a, a litigator to being a music licensing specialist. Um, I did have an eight year hiatus to be a full-time mom and I'm thanking my family members who are watching today. Uh, I went back to work for a friend who happened to have this established music entertainment um, practice. And uh, again, after that um, position ended uh, due to no fault of my employer <laughs> uh, or myself, 
I went uh, on to become an independent contractor for um, another, uh, well, for a bit, very busy um, production company slash studio. Um, and so now I can start telling you a little bit about what these terms I'm throwing around might mean. So a music publishing company uh, represents the songwriters and promotes their work by finding artists to record the compositions or by administering the rights to license the compositions, all for a share of the income. And please note, a composition are the words and melody of a song rather than the recording of a song, which is known as a master recording, which is typically represented by a label. Think records, CDs, digital downloads. So these two terms I mention quite often, you have a master recording and you have uh, the composition um, and it's, those are referred to as sides uh, when I'm talking about music licensing. Um, anyway, back to my second position in the entertainment business. Um, I was hired as an independent contractor to draft and review music licenses, mostly as a licensee on many films and a couple of television productions. And I reviewed the composer agreements, which are the uh, songwriter or, and also usually the performer who creates the score for a film or a television show. The score is that sort of light background music or sometimes a driving uh, sound but usually it's instrumental and it, it appears throughout the uh, production as, and that does not need to be licensed. And I'll talk to you about that a little bit later. I also learned about the post-production world in film and television. Post-production is the aspect of a film or other project which occurs after the filming, the sound mixing, the editing of the project, adding credits and the like. This segued into more jobs as an independent contractor. And so now I work on behalf of a variety of large and small independent production companies, including Endeavor Content, Bronze Studios, Big Beach Films, uh, Blinding Edge, which is M. Night Shyamalan's uh, company, uh, and Library Films, which produces a lot of very high quality documentaries. I've been able to do this work from home for the past 16 years. So I've had fewer adjustments to make uh, during this past two and a half years than many of you. Uh, as Mary mentioned, I've worked on a number of projects and uh, including two that have been recently nominated for Emmys, which are Severance and also 100 Foot Wave on HBO. Um, the variety of projects I work on make my work uh, I think a little bit more exciting. Um, it's always good to learn about new things when I'm working on documentaries and uh, I enjoy watching movies as much as any other lay person. So um, I'm gonna be talking about the clearance and licensing of an existing song for use in a production, which may be shown at a movie theater, on TV, via streaming like on Hulu or Netflix or other platforms briefly Quibi, which I don't know if any of you had a chance to hear about. Uh, it was a flash in the pan right before COVID. Music helps draw you into a scene and emotionally involves you. It's an important device in filmmaking and is being employed more frequently these days. And Mary, if you can roll the clip. It worked. She actually did this. So I say the end, I saw you again. Today, I have it on my heart away. And that smile like the sun kisses for And tears <laughs> is never fade. And this
Um, and by the way, I'm using this clip under the fair use doctrine for educational purposes, and I will discuss more about that concept later as well. Um, this was a clip of a movie that I worked on, Iconia, and the song is Barracuda, um, as some of you may have uh, recognized. And um, in this case, the song is viewed as containing two sides, as I had mentioned, the lyrics and the melodies, the composition. And in the above case, in Barracuda was written by Ann Wilson, Nancy Wilson, who are hard, Michael DeRossier and Roger Fisher. And the publisher was Universal Music Publishing Group. The master recording that you heard, the actual recording of the song by heart is on the Sony sublabel Epic. I'm going to explain the steps from deciding to use the song in a production to the licensing of the song and the delivery of all the licenses to a distributor, the entity which actually exploits the show via its platforms, such as cable TV, streaming services, or theaters. In Itanya's case, the distributor was Neon, a fairly new production company and distributor. Neon can then make a deal with movie theaters or Netflix or Hulu, and an independent production company rarely distributes its own productions. My clients all fall into the indie category. Even the larger ones create new LLCs for almost each production. My relationship with a production company begins with a producer or music, music executive. And if the project has a music supervisor, then he or she or they are also an important contact. Either the music supervisor or the director or a combination of the two will choose the songs for the project. A music supervisor negotiates deal points and contracts prepares music budgets and attends scheduled meetings and spotting sessions. They oversee the music being written as score as for a project, as I mentioned. Um, they organize the music orchestration. Um, and a music supervisor is typically more of a creative individual um, as opposed to uh, say somebody like me who's mostly just taking direction from the director and I'm not usually coming up with the, the songs that they, uh, would like to use for the um, production. If there is no music supervisor, then I'm going to be the one to clear the songs, meaning locating the copyright holders, you know, a record label uh, for the master recording, and a publishing company for the composition. That again is the words and music. A recording of a song may be by one artist or another, so there could be multiple choices of which master to license. For example, Atlantic City was recorded by both the band and Bruce Springsteen, but only one choice of songwriter, Bruce Springsteen, who was represented by Sony Music Publishing. No matter how many different covers or recordings of the song there are, there's only one uh, group of writers for that particular song. For other songs, there may be multiple writers represented by different publishing companies but there's still no choice as to which writers are responsible for the words and melodies. Sometimes a song is written and recorded by an independent singer-songwriter, and we deal directly with that person or their manager. Certain terms must be requested during the clearance process. Trying to add them to the music licenses after the fact will hold up the process at best or will be not denied at worst. These terms include the right to parody or change or translate the lyrics or compositions. For masters, sometimes the speed of the song needs to be changed, or if the recording isn't long enough, the master may need to be looped or repeated. The main resources to locate the publishers are through a repertory search on the ASCAP, EMI, or CSEC sites. These are the United States performance rights organizations. They collect royalties for the writers and publishers and distribute them. Most songwriters want to be affiliated with one of these societies so they can collect fees from their songs being used in public, such as at a bar, a gym, or as will be discussed later, from cue sheets relating to movies and television shows. For the labels, 
Discogs or all music are good resources as is Spotify, which notes credits, including great record labels. Or sometimes I just uh, rely on a general internet search. Note that the labels are often sold and publishing shares transferred. So it's not always a straightforward process. Sometimes I have to be a detective, which can be rewarding or frustrating. The music supervisor, or I, will send a request to quote. Um, I have included, I think, in a packet of documents, um, some samples, and uh, if you have access to them, you can look at them now or later. Um, and uh, one of them is the request to quote, and it indicates the song desired, the use of the song with the approximate timing requested, and a scene description. Also, a brief synopsis of the project, and then the media needed. Sometimes I will just need a film festival license to be quoted, perhaps with an option to expand to all media. This gives um, a fledgling uh, director, uh, producer with a, a small film to just enter it in film festivals where they hope it will be picked up by a distributor, but they're not uh, incurring the uh, large fee that an all media license might uh, require. Um, but then by asking uh, for an option, then they know what they will be needing to come up with later should they find distribution. Um, the term, the territory, uh, the term is the length of time. The territory is usually the world and the percentage of the composition or master that is controlled by the copyright holder or I ask for confirmation of the same. The hope is to get approval permission to use the song and negotiate the fee in an amount that works with the film's budget. The original songwriter or its estate if the songwriter is deceased or the artist may be the one to give or deny approval. If the approval party isn't thrilled about the project or, or how its song is being used or merely to keep a song from being over, overused or oversaturated in the market, they may deny approval. Fee considerations are dependent on the show or film's overall budget and the media requested and the amount of time the song is used. If the song is very central to the scene, that can also be a factor. It's a very fluid process. I have to say in the example of the I, Tanya, um, that was a montage, and it was a much longer use than I um, showed on the clip. And uh, that is all factors in making the song be more expensive than another song in the film. <clears throat> if the fee is in the budget, a letter of confirmation, which I also included in the packet of documents, uh, as to the agreed upon terms, may be issued by a music supervisor or myself. This is a placeholder and not a guarantee the song will be used. And depending on when in the process this is issued, if the film hasn't been locked, which I'll talk about that later, um, the timing may be off a little bit. So we tend to try and not send out letters of confirmation too far in advance of a final version of the film, but sometimes um, just to make sure that we know the fees are in place, we'll send out a letter of confirmation. Uh, a copy of the um, includes basically the information that was in the request to quote the media, whether it's in theaters um, or sometimes all media excluding theatrical, which is what a lot of the streaming platforms um, require, or again, maybe just for film festivals. <clears throat> the term can be in one for one year, that's usually related to film festivals or in perpetuity. The territory is usually the world. And the use could be a background use where you don't see the song being played, it's just like in the I, Tanya clip, or a visual use, meaning on screen, either the um, performers are playing an instrument or they're singing the song like a karaoke scene. And the time of use, how long the song plays. And if it's interrupted, perhaps there's a little bit of uh, use of the song, then there's a scene, and then the song continues. Or if it's used multiple times, it may appear at the beginning of the film and then maybe towards the middle and maybe towards the end. 
The percentage of the composition or the master controlled, and I'll discuss that a little bit more later, and the agreed upon fee. And again, that fee is based on 100%. Um, again, fees are based on the type of media, the most expensive being theatrical, and the least tending towards the one year film festival use. Um, if a master recording is being created by the production company, for example, there's a band playing on camera and the band members are part of the production, um, actors or such, then only the composition needs to be cleared. Most songs are cleared on a most favored nations or MFN status with the other side. A master recording is considered one side and the composition is the other side. And meaning the fee for the composition and the master must match. Occasionally, all of the songs in a project may be required by a few licensors to be on an MFN rate, um, meaning that their song is, not, is gonna be no less expensive uh, than some other well-known song. Um, and an exclusion can be made for the opening or end credits, which usually command a higher fee. The reason a publisher or label may want all the songs to be MFN is when they believe they're providing a low fee for their song and want to make sure other major licensors are also taking the same low fee for any well-known songs in the project. Any exceptions to the MFN rate must be clearly noted and accepted. Many songs have more than one writer or a publisher and all must be accounted for in order to license 100% of the composition. Some writers may split the composition 50-50 or uh, other percentages or splits. For example, there may be three writers on a song, but one writer contributed 50% of the words and music, and the remaining two writers contributed 25% each. This is up to the writers to determine their splits or shares. Uh, and another reason that a publisher may not control 100% uh, is that the world is divided into various percentages depending on the perceived market. For example, the United States and Canada are considered 50% of the world. So a publisher may control just 50% for the world, but in other words, 100% for the United States. And another publishing administrator for the writers may represent the song in another part of the world. But the key is to get this all to add up to 100%. Um, I will, as an aside, in the world of uh, hip hop and rap, uh, often there are, it can be, I don't know, 15 or 20 writers and trying to uh, make sure that the percentages are accurate and uh, you've rounded up all the parties is uh, kind of challenging. Um, also a master may have multiple owners, but this is slightly less common. It could be a master is controlled by different labels in different parts of the world or uses a sample of another song, which may be accounted for and paid. I'm going to hopefully assume people know what a sample is. It's like, a, let's say in the song, um, uh, Ice, Ice Baby, they took a lot of under pressure and put that in there. And so that becomes part of Ice, Ice Baby. And then you have to uh, clear both the uh, Bowie and Queen parts of the song, including, and also the uh, Manila Ice part of the song. Um, exceptions to clearance. Some songs are in the public domain. In the United States, that's a song whose composition was published or written before 1927. However, as most uses are needed for worldwide clearance, the standard is 100 years after the death of the last composer. That is because Mexico has the longest uh, rule uh, for public domain uh, it's again 100 years after the death of the last composer. So it controls the time frame for all of the um, other uh, music uh, in the uh, project and uh, for public domain. So um, for that particular song. 
For a master or sound recording, it's more complicated. Before 1976, sound recordings were not protected by national copyright law in the United States. Instead, the protection of the works was under the jurisdiction of the state. And although the Copyright Act of 1976, which is also provided to you, um, provided that federal copyright protection to sound recordings created after 1972, it otherwise left state protections in place until at least 2067. However, the 2018 Music Modernization Act extended federal copyright protection pre-1972 sound recordings, and it also shortened their term of protection. Typically, that basically means for us is that uh, sound recordings are hardly ever public domain and uh, many compositions can be traditional songs and such, so they don't need to be cleared. Sometimes a song is claimed to be fair use, so no license is needed. This is limited, especially in commercial films, and if claimed, a letter from a fair use attorney or a production council is needed to protect the production company from a copyright infringement claim and also to satisfy the distributor, who I will get to in a little bit. <clears throat> Fair use is set forth in the United States Copyright Act and is claimed when one of four factors have been met. Um, however, of course, like all legislation, it can be uh, subject to interpretation by the courts. Um, the first uh, factor is the purpose and character of the use including whether such use is of commercial nature or is for nonprofit educational uses. Um, so that is why I referred to my uh, using the Barracuda uh, film clip as being uh, cleared under fair use, I hope. Uh, applicable here, it's whether the music is being commented upon in the documentary, which can be fair use, uh, versus a, a focal point in a narrative film, where it usually is never. Um, the second factor is the nature of the copyrighted work, whether it's fiction or nonfiction, and the amount um, for number three is the amount and substantiality of the portion used in relation to the copyrighted work as a whole. So relating to music, whether a very short use uh, versus long, Typically, people will say under three seconds could be considered um, fair use. But again, if it's a commercial um, project, uh, or as opposed to, let's say, a documentary, um, it usually is not easy to clear as fair use or be determined to be fair use. The effect of the use upon the potential market or the value of the copyrighted work is number four. I myself do not offer fair use opinions, and um, I rely that my clients will get, uh, if they want something to be considered fair use, um, that opinion come from production council or um, from a special fair use uh, attorney. And I believe it has a very limited application in music, in films, um, especially, as I said, if they are not documentary films. If a song is neither in the public domain, pardon me, my <clears throat> it might be composed, especially for the film, as I mentioned, by the uh, film's uh, score composer. And that is he or she is usually hired in accordance with a work for hire contract. Um, so the composer uh, would write and record the music but the production company would then own um, the music. And that's the typical hope for situation. Sometimes if it's a very famous composer, they may say, I'm gonna own my compositions and I'll license them to you, but you can own the music that was recorded. Um, it depends on the uh, various um, strengths in the bargaining process that the composer may have with the production. Um, uh, company. Once the project is mixed by members of the post-production team, meaning edited with sound and picture together, 
for its final time, and the song timings are certain, licenses can be requested or drafted. And I'm going to ask Mary to share um, my template of a music license on the screen for you all to refer to, and I will um, discuss the various paragraphs, some um, clumped together and uh, some uh, individually. Okay, before I do that, I just want to let everybody know that the code word for those of you who are seeking to receive CLE is Barracuda. It's on your screen now. The code word is Barracuda, and you can send your documents to Lisa Ravage at Albany Law School. Thank you. And uh, are you able to get that? There we go. Okay. Um, so now we're up to the uh, real excitement <laughs> in terms of a, a music synchronization and master use license. Um, and um, basically they're contracts uh, between a production company and a copyright holder to permit the production company to use a composition or a master, or in this case, both, as synchronized in the soundtrack of a production meaning that the audio, the song is played in time with the visual, the picture, whether it's a film, series, uh, website, or any type of media, which is an audio visual. I know I mentioned I did do some um, work uh, for a podcast and they still require a, a sync license even though there's really no um, visual attached to that. Um, I'm going to refer you to paragraphs one through six which are the um, terms that we've been discussing ad nauseum in the uh, quote and re uh, request to quote and the letter of confirmation. But basically, again, you're giving the title, the writers, in this case, also the artist, because it's for a master and a synchronization or composition license, um, the publisher, uh, and the label. Uh, and then uh, in this case, the licensor uh, controlled 100% in both the composition and the master. Um, and I actually wanna take a look at that after because I think in this particular license, there may have been uh, a 50% in the composition and 100 in the master, but we'll see. Um, and the use of the composition and master uh, in the whatever the film is called, um, and for a background vocal use, meaning that nobody sees the performance. It's just being played in the background for about 31 seconds. <clears throat> um, as I mentioned, this is, um, there's synchronization licenses, uh, sometimes can be referred to just the composition license. Um, and people say that's a sync license. Um, technically though, a license uh, to synchronize and master reporting is also a sync license. But for some reason, masters are just referred to as masters and composition licenses are referred to as composition or sync, sync licenses. Um, and again, I mentioned that the use is to note whether it's in the background, uh, it could be a vocal, it could just be instrumental, um, it could be, if it's a visual vocal that the actor is singing it uh, in the scene. Um, it also could even be sometimes considered a visual vocal. If you can see the source of the music, like a um, record player um, playing the song, um, spinning around, that sometimes is referred to as a visual vocal. Uh, again, the amount of time and um, is noted. In paragraphs four and five, uh, I discuss um, the term, which is the length that the production needs to use, and it's usually in perpetuity. And again, um, number four is the uh, territory. Uh, and again, usually it is worldwide these days. And um, I'm going to skip over six for a moment and go to paragraph 7a. And this is really like the nuts and bolts in terms of this is the right to synchronize the master recording and the composition into the soundtrack of a visual medium. It means it can only be used with the pictures accompanying the music, no sound only use. Um, and uh, the copyright holders 
want to make sure that that's very clear because they don't want you uh, going off and making uh, your own records of their songs. Um, the right is typically non-exclusive, meaning the licensor may license and use the song in any way it sees fit, whether or not it's licensed the song to you. In advertising, some uses are exclusive. Um, for example, an ad company may require that the song that they want to license is licensed to them exclusively for a period of time. And it's typically limited to ads for um, of a similar product. So like not every car ad has the same uh, song in it for you know, that period of time that the, uh, the ad is out. But this is not the case in film or television licenses. These are all non-exclusive licenses. As media has evolved, the most typical production um, media or language for a production that's intended for movie theaters is all media now known or here and after devised. In earlier days, the phrase now known or here and after devised or NKHD was not included, thus necessitating many older licenses to be upgraded and higher fees paid for uses such as streaming or digital downloads or even Blu-ray or DVDs. If you think of um, some of the original Saturday Night Live episodes, maybe done in 1974 or 75, where none of these platforms were contemplated um, and there's music in them, those uh, licenses all have to be updated. Um, and uh, I think because of the expense, some, some episodes of Saturday Night Live forego the music um, in them uh, that was originally there because they just don't want to pay for upgraded licenses. So next time you watch an old episode, see if you see if there's any music. Um, and uh, including the, the, how the band performs, there's usually a live performance by a, a band, um, but then after that it's recorded. So you have, still have to get the composition and the, um, whoever may own the master recording of that. It could be the production company or the distributor like NBC. I'm not particularly sure in the Saturday Night Live uh, example. If the production is not intended for theatrical use, but um, mostly this is pertaining to television or streaming applications, it's all media now known and here and after devised, excluding theatrical use. <clears throat> I do also provide some other definitions um, in the materials, so you can take a look at those at your leisure. In paragraph eight, um, there is a provision often included that um, allows the song to be used in in-context advertising use. And that means that a clip of the project contained in the license, containing the licensed music may be included in an ad or trailer for the film or show, but only in the exact way it appeared in the original production, not over any other scenes or longer than license. If a trailer for the project um, is required and the song at issue is desired to run over various other scenes uh, or somebody speaking in a separate trailer, um, then a different license has to be issued for that. And that is called out of context ad use or trailer use. Um, I'm going to reference back to um, paragraph 7b, 1 and 2. And this has to do with the composition only. So even though this is a license for both the master and the um, composition, this particular language only applies to the composition. Um, after a production is in its final form, a cue sheet is created, which notes the song, the writers, the publishers, and whether the song is a visual vocal, background vocal, et cetera, and also the timing of the song. And I also include a sample of a cue sheet um, as one of the uh, documents. Um, just to note, if there's a case where the license was issued before the final mix um, and the final timing on the cue sheet is longer than what was in the license. 
the license will have to be revised. Um, this can usually be accomplished by handwritten cha timing change initialed by both parties. Uh, the percentage of controller ownership is also noted in the cue sheet. And that again, they all have to add up to 100%. Um, it's noted a writer always retains his writer share on a cue sheet, and then the publisher um, could be that writer's publisher, or and if it's a score where perhaps the production company um, owns the um, the product, the score, uh, they still they can have the publishing aspect on the cue sheet, but not the writer's share. <clears throat> it's the cue sheet is submitted to various performance rights societies and allows the writers and the publishers to collect the public performance royalties when their song is synchronized in the show, plays on certain media. In the United States, that's television and streaming platforms, but not movie theaters. While in Europe, public performance royalties are captured by theatrical exhibition. But via the um, Music Modernization Act, now master recordings receive public performance royalties too, through sound exchange. It's a pittance, I understand, but it's something. Most licenses for compositions include a provision that the licensee or its assigns are exploiting the show on a platform with valid performance rights license. This is all still part of the um, seven um, or will negotiate such a license. Initially, I believe that Netflix um, was slow to the game in uh, being uh, associated with the performance rights organizations, but now I believe that they are. So uh, the writers and publishers are getting royalties from things that air on Netflix. Um, other terms in a synchronization license are the ability to translate the lyrics for subtitling in foreign languages. This has become more important as global streaming has taken off. So um, in addition to making the request uh, at the request to quote stage, I would also include um, abilities to subtitle in foreign territories um, as part of the composition request. And uh, I also include a publisher's license in um, the samples of materials. Um, the ability to assign the license to a distributor. Most production companies, as I mentioned, don't actually exploit or air the shows they produce, but assign them to a platform such as Apple TV or Netflix, or to a movie distributor such as Universal, Lionsgate, or Sony Pictures. This is why the licenses end up being a very important piece of the project's delivery. That meaning the um, production company will have to give the uh, distributor the film, all the actors' contracts, um, any other supporting documentation, and that includes the music licenses. And um, the distributor may withhold certain payments to the production company if the documentation is not up to stuff. So even though licenses tend to come at the end of a production, if they're not complete or accurate, it can tie up many millions of dollars. So uh, I tend to uh, think about the distributor uh, at the end when I'm uh, trying to get my job done correctly. And I wanna make sure all my I's are dotted and my T's are crossed and my timings are correct and et cetera. Um, because I don't want to be the one holding up the money to my client. Uh, the copyright holder in paragraph 10 um, must warrant ownership and indemnify the licensee in case of an adverse claim. And this is also very important to the distributor. Um, however, typically the licensor will limit the amount of its liability to the fee paid. And although that doesn't make the uh, distributor happy, it's an accepted standard in the industry. Paragraph 12 includes uh, a waiver of injunctive relief. Um, this is in case there's a breach of the license and the production company or its distributor do not want the show uh, taken off the air or out of theaters in the event of an adverse claim. This is necessary to provide for 
as injunctive relief is a remedy for copyright infringement, according to the statute. And that's in 17 U.S. Code, Section 502. Uh, a 30-day notice to cure any breaches is now a standard in the industry uh, as a necessary term. Uh, some newer provisions, and this goes back to the fee section, is the acknowledgement by a licensor that no additional fees uh, are, are due from the licensee. Um, and this can include a mechanical reproduction fee uh, pertaining to digital downloads or home viewing devices. In the United States and Canada, these fees are allowed to be bought out. However, in countries such as France and Germany, they're not. So an exception may be carved in the license where permitted in the territory. Mechanical reproduction fees emanate from mechanical royalties, which is a whole different lecture but um, it does refer to the embodiment of the composition in a physical device, such as a phono record or DVD. And originally that was from a player piano rule. Um, but now it's been transposed to uh, expanded as a fee to DVDs or videotapes or even digital downloads. So that's where these mechanical reproduction fees come in. So again, if you are, um, doing all media, including, um, let's say, DVDs or uh, digital downloads, you want to make sure that no further fees are going to have to be um, paid in respect of, of that. And that's where the mechanical reproduction fees come in. And that's a fairly new concern um, in respect of distributors. So that's why we include that. Now, another fee that needs to be budgeted for by the production company um, are union fees in relation to the master recording. So um, that may be charged by uh, the union SAG-AFTRA, uh, which represents the artists who are the people vocalizing the song, and AFM, which represents musicians. If the label that you're licensing the song from is a signatory to those union agreements. So those are mostly the major labels. A lot of the independent record labels um, aren't signatories and you don't have to worry about this. But if you're dealing with somebody like Sony uh, or Universal or um, uh, Warner, then you definitely have to be concerned when you sign the license that you may be responsible for union reuse or new use fees. If the license is under $7,500, the fees will be charged upfront by the label on behalf of the union members. These are capped and relatively low fees, like in the amounts of about $165 per person. And they represent the union benefits to the artist or the singer or the musicians for the fact that their recording is used in a new medium. If the master fee is over $7,500, the fees won't come from the label, but they can be charged by the unions and can be billed anytime up to three years after the project's been released. So uh, some of my clients get surprise bills when they think uh, the production has closed up shop. So it's good to have some um, money set aside uh, in this eventuality. Um, and the fees can add up. Uh, with the 7,500 and under uh, a fee, even with an orchestra, the amount is capped at a fairly reasonable rate. Um, but if it's um, licenses for over $7,500 and you're using an orchestra and you can imagine that you have to pay uh, benefits to all the members of the orchestra or their um, beneficiaries, then um, it could add up to a lot of money. Uh, they are applicable to recordings made after 1964. So if you need an orchestral uh, master, it's better to find one that was created before 1964 or use a non-signatory uh, recording. Um, and I'll go down to now paragraph 13. The choice of law and venue may be addressed in the license. And typically the license for will choose which territory has laws most favorable to it. Um, well, the licensee will also uh, 
prescribe for the same. New York State and California are known as having very well developed case law in regard to the entertainment industry. Other provisions may include the ability to accept digital signatures and exchange the documents through email as opposed to hard copies, which has definitely made my life easier. Um, paragraph 15, uh, the credits must be accepted upon, agreed upon rather, or no credit acknowledged as acceptable. Um, typically in a TV series, there aren't any music credits at the end of the show, but in the movie, there definitely are. Um, and an example of a credit may be the song title, the writer, the artist, and a label courtesy credit. Typically, um, publishers don't demand that their um, credit be given on screen as long as no other publisher is getting credit. Um, it uh, has to be consistent. Um, some major labels will actually add penalty language if the credits are admitted and um, other license holders are receiving credit. Uh, so it's another important um, aspect to review when going over the licenses and the backup documentation. And then both parties will sign the license. Um, I will speedily go through my conclusion uh, where I can end here and you can uh, have the question section, whichever you uh, prefer. Why don't we just quickly see, Elise, if anybody wants to unmute and ask a question at this time? Okay. So, Elise, I will turn it over to you to have you conclude. Very good. Um, the relationships develop at both the clearance and the licensing stage. The larger publishers and labels divide their staff so one person is assigned as your contact in the clearance phase and others in the licensing phase. It should be noted that the labels and publishers licensing contacts are not usually attorneys, but must kick any questions up to their business affairs or legal departments. It's also worth noting that a conflict of interest could occur if you don't keep in mind your client's best interests, even though you tend to work consistently with the publishing labels and want to keep them on your good side as well. Uh, however, I feel a good relationship with the publishers and labels will ultimately inure to your client's benefit in better fees or quick turnaround times on licenses. Um, and uh, I did want to note that new media is constantly developing, but the publishers and labels tend to be a little bit behind the curve. Um, but I find it's uh, satisfying to get them to get up to speed with, with new language uh, as, as uh, is needed in the industry. Um, and I'd say I wanted to talk briefly just about the most challenging production that I ever worked on was where the songs were being created by famous current hip hop and pop artists who are friends of the director. Um, I had to work with the labels to determine ownership. And if one of the um, artists might be on one label and another artist might be on another label, who's going to be owning the song? Um, and then also working out all the splits. Um, and well, first of all, finding all the songwriters and the producers and working out the splits and percentages of ownership with the publishing companies. So that, that uh, in addition to just uh, working on the licensing, um, the pre-clearance aspect was uh, very challenging. Um, and I just want to conclude by saying that music licenses are very practical documents and the parties try to work collaboratively. They are um, accepted standard, there are accepted standards in the industry. And in order to make the process run smoothly um, while still protecting the licensor and licensee, most parties tend to resolve any issues in an amicable fashion. Um, I enjoy working out solutions and working in an area with both feet in the world of music and film and television. Um, I feel like I'm on the cutting edge of pop culture. Plus my clients, some of whom may be watching today, are wonderful uh, people. And uh, I thank everybody for listening. 
Thank you, Luis, so much for taking the time to share your expertise with us today. Um, the depth and breadth of your knowledge is incredible, and we are so fortunate to have you support um, the Women's Leadership Initiative at Albany Law School and be a role model for so many of our students who are interested in entering into this field. So with with that, I will end the program and we will send the recording out to anyone who may have missed it. And I thank you and I look forward to staying in touch. Me too. Thanks a lot, Mary. It was a pleasure. Bye. Have a great day, everyone. <laughs>